Great, so I'm back here with Amber, who of course is co-founder and CEO of Clover. Amber, how the heck are you? I'm great. Uh, what brings you to London? Uh, I'm here for a conference on, on Thursday. BAE is throwing a all-women cybersecurity conference. That's really cool. All women speakers. The the audience is anybody. But. Yeah, I was going to say, like, ah, I want to get yeah. in and press my face against the glass, hopefully. <laughs> all are welcome. Yeah, I think it's called Reset, and it's really the first kind of all women lineup. Oh, that's cool. Um, so it should be cool, yeah. Um, well, let us know how that goes. Be sure to come back on the show. But uh, you recently left the world of financial services uh, incumbents and ventured out to build a startup. So uh, before we get into you know, kind of who Clover are and what they do, like reflect back for me on the last sort of two, three years in the industry, you know, what has been the key learnings? What did you take away from kind of the last couple of years? Wow, it's been a roller coaster. Yeah, hasn't it just? <laughs> um, most, mostly up, uh, but you know, po- poised for that the loop to loops coming on the roller coaster. I guess, but uh, <laughs> Ooh, my favorite bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's been really interesting. I mean, I started um, reading about and being interested in uh, Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, but more from a, a political and cybersecurity angle back in you know like 2011. Um, and had always followed that, just thinking it was going to be this kind of niche toy of hackers and cypherpunks. And, you know, I thought maybe someday it would be traded on the FX desk at JP Morgan, where I was working already at the time, um, when Occupy, Wall Street, and all this other stuff was happening. Um, and, uh, it, you know, but that didn't happen. It was always like zero results on our internal search. So I happened to hear that there was this one team that was working on uh, not just blockchain, but machine learning and some cloud strategy and API stuff and moved over there um, to because I, I knew they were doing blockchain things, um, but first started in machine learning and you know, eventually aggregated the the team together <laughs> and created the blockchain center of excellence there. But it was a it was a great journey um, to spend a lot of time working uh, not with man just with management at JPM, although we certainly did a lot of education and evangelism there. But to get to talk with central banks and uh, asset managers and also Fortune 100 corporates, you know, and and hear how they're trying to use this blockchain or distributed ledger tech completely apart from what was happening in the trading space. Um, and there weren't a lot of people at that time that were going back and forth that could discuss both. Mm-hmm. It kind of felt like a lot of people who had my job at other institutions had at some point been handed a PowerPoint um, that said, like, you know, you're in charge of the blockchain now. Yeah. Uh, and it was just it was just strange that they were coming from this philosophy of how are we going to transform banking systems? Yeah. Um, Rather than what is it and why is it? Yeah. And and where is where is the rest of this kind of community coming from? And, mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, I guess just because of that, I got to explain a lot of things to a lot of people I didn't really expect to. Um, yeah. And it's, it's been really fun. Uh, the, something interesting about going through that experience of um, being put in front of the clients and being put in front of the, uh, the, the kind of the internal senior management and also bumping into a whole bunch of people internally that you would never come across. Like, what was the takeaway from that? I'm guessing people reacted differently at different times over that kind of two, three year period. Absolutely. I mean, there were times when people felt, you know, challenged and they were worried that their business models were going to be under attack. Uh, at other times, it was very kind of hopeful and opportunistic mm-hmm. that if we could find uh, a business model that was going to really be transformative, that there might be completely new top line revenue opportunities. Um, and then, you know, figuring out how the entire industry was going to interact with what was happening in the public space um, and having relationships of people that I had known for years that have been in um, Bitcoin and now these other kind of projects that have come out uh, to hear from their side kind of what w- was happening um, out there. It, it was uh, very fascinating. Yeah. Isn't it kind of weird how those two worlds collided? It, it was mm-hmm. almost like um, Neo in the Matrix. You have the like life of the day job and life kind of outside that. And those two things actually became one and you were paid to do it. <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, it, it's it's great that I've had this kind of platform and I, I'm very appreciative of it. But there are a lot of people at these institutions that know exactly what's going on. The problem is that the, these enterprises keep them in the basement and call themselves cyber and don't let them uh, ever talk to clients or management or they see um, in information security as a check the box kind of mm-hmm. an activity. Uh, but there's a lot of expertise already. These people have day jobs. We just need to find them. And typically, the my experience was exactly the same. When I spoke to information security, I would get through to that one person who really knew their stuff 
typically extremely articulate, typically ridiculously intelligent, uh, and and would get it and say, like, oh yeah, I already read about that. I, I didn't have to inform them anything. I would just sit and start listening. And then my job was to go tell everybody else what they just said. And I was like, why is that the case? Like, why don't people listen to these people? There's an interesting cultural observation there. So what happened next? You've, you've obviously uh, kind of left that world now to go form Clover. Tell me what is Clover? Yeah. So uh, what I ended up realizing through all of these conversations over the last couple years is that building blockchain applications is hard. <laughs> and it's hard whether you are uh, a consortium of enterprises or whether you're a hobbyist out in you know your house. Um, it's too difficult to get to the part where you're working on whatever your unique vision is, whether that is a new post-trade settlement system or whether that's something that looks like CryptoKitties. The development tooling uh, simply isn't there. And and furthermore, these uh, groups have been developing uh, their quote unquote best practices <laughs> for what are better or worse right now um, and, and tool suites uh, completely independent of each other. Yeah. Right? So if you're deploying something to a public network, the process is incredibly different than if you're deploying something to an enterprise or a permissioned chain. And I really, yeah. I fight back against the idea that permissioned equals enterprise and public equals uh, some sort of like proletariat kind of thing. Here, here. <laughs> You know, ideally, we want the information to sit where it makes sense. And I can see, you know, um, I, I have gotten plenty of inbound inquiries of people that wanted to, say, use uh, the Quorum, for example, the platform that we were working on at JP Morgan. The, um, it's a privacy and enterprise focused version of Ethereum uh, that wanted to use that as a side chain to mainnet Ethereum to, say, run their video game. Yeah. And they wanted to do that because the gas costs were going to be cheaper. And, and they performant. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and then you know commit the results of those games back to the mainnet. So there's there's other reasons to use sidechains or, or permission chains as sidechains for scalability and performance and privacy and other things. Um, and if you start yeah. looking at some of the second layer scaling solutions, sharding, plasma, mm -hmm. Raiden, they start to look a little bit like the, a sidechain in, in some of the instances. So like we're gonna naturally have to go there if these things are gonna reach scale at some point. We're sure. gonna get yeah, it's going to be a mixture of things. I I still think that there's a, a a use for permission networks um, from a simply a security boundary standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we were just talking on the, the or we're, we're about to talk about the yeah. <laughs> EOS news bit, um, you know, of things that infect a, a main net. And so having networks of networks where you have security boundaries is not necessarily a bad thing. It's an imperfect metaphor, but the VPN and internet, like there's, there's value in a VPN, there's value in an intranet, like mm -hmm. creating security boundaries and firewalls makes sense for a lot of reasons. It's not the big revolutionary thing, but it by itself can solve a problem. And if it uses the same set of standards and rules as the main internet, like mm -hmm. you can see how the two would co-, co it, it also allows people to create more kind of fractal governance processes. Ooh, there's a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can fragment those things and then, you know, it's not necessarily about keeping people out. And I think the the concept of permission networks has historically, it makes people people think keep people out. But you could have a publicly accessible network. It just, when you come in here, the rules are, are, are thus. And it's similar to something like Mastodon, which is a you know peer-to-peer -peer federated system, which does not necessarily need a blockchain. Shocking, I know. Um, but depending on which Mastodon server you choose, you're abiding by a specific rule set um, of the keeper of, of those servers. So uh, I think the, that this network of networks we're going to get is going to look a lot more complex, but hopefully more functional um, than what we have now. And you asked me what Clover is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but the you know it was a great rabbit hole. I enjoyed it anyway. Yeah, yeah. well, um, there's no way to get there from here right now with the tools that we have. So what we're working on is this um, developer tooling wherein you can use the exact same unified framework to deploy to a public mainnet as you could to an enterprise um, sort of consortium, and that uh, you know f finding. To go back to what we were saying before about kind of this weird space that that we've inhabited between um, speaking to the cypherpunk kind of crowd and speaking to the C-suite, uh, it turns out they have a lot of similar problems. Um, for example, a bank consortium might not want to deploy to a public cloud for regulation reasons. A cypherpunk may not want to deploy to public cloud for surveillance reasons. Yes. Right. So if you can containerize um, this kind of process and make things scalable and usable, uh, you can solve both ends of the bell curve in a way that I think they're going to actually knit together over time. Interesting that like those two 
different uh, perspectives have similar problems, but coming out from a completely different angle. It's the same thing that I was finding with strong encryption, right? And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, p- privacy advocates have fought for years for strong encryption, uh, which, you know, for the uninitiated generally just means that these these systems are not weakened and they're not backdoored in some way. There's no God keys. Um, and, uh, and businesses have seen some sort of God key as an escape hatch and, a, and an enterprise feature. Mm-hmm. Um, but now they're starting to realize that if if we have shared mutualized networks and there's a God key and one person gets it and then another person gets it yeah. or a foreign government gets it, uh, it's, you know, it's rabbit hole. Yeah, it, it, it's game theory playing out, right? Game theory when I win seems great. Like mm-hmm. this winner take all thing, if I win, great. But actually, if I realize I'm in a community and somebody else could also win, then suddenly I want the rules to be different. Exactly. And so when we, you know, th- this was a lot of the education that I was doing early on was, you know, stop thinking about these peer-to-peer systems as just Alice to Bob and person to person. Mm -hmm. And we started thinking about them corporate to corporate or bank to bank. But really, it's about sovereign to sovereign. So where are the trust boundaries uh, geopolitically, globally? They, you know, historically, we had these kind of centralized institutions like a trade registry, for example. It's not that technically we couldn't create a trade registry. It's that no one could really agree on what jurisdiction it could sit in. Absolutely. And so you couldn't trade 24-7 because, and you couldn't globally form capital. Mm-hmm. This is um, something I've been passionate about for some time is that as uh, somebody starting a project or a company in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and in Indonesia, uh, I can't access a global investor base. I can access a local one. If I happen to be in Silicon Valley, great. I've got a lot of investors in my back door and my valuation is 10x what it would be in another city somewhere else in the world just because of the amount of capital that I'm near. Granted, there's an agglomeration effect piece there where there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of capital and there's a lot of uh, former founders who can help you and so on and so on. But actually, to get to the value of truly globalized trade, you have to find a way to deal with that fundamental problem, which is how on earth do I form capital and move capital globally and deal with the geopolitical issue at the same time? And maybe that gives us a way to start to do that if we all play by that same set of rules. But you have to have that fractalization of the network. You have to have an ability for the rules to be one thing over here, something else over here, but still compatible at the higher level. That's a really interesting question. Um, Preston Byrne, for all he's uh, lauded and uh, hated, uh, he did often talk about Ethereum being a spine to a network of potential uh, permission chains in 2014, bless him. And, And I think that idea of is not wrong. Like it's 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 where we're heading, but what shape it takes is going to be interesting to see. Yeah, and um, being peer to peer, government to government is one thing. But what happens when uh, consumers and and you know regular people, as consumers are in their daily lives, um, actually uh, are on public chains doing things, their daily activity, or you get you know Airbnb of the blockchain, what have you, and then uh, other corporates and institutions want to have access to that kind of information. Hmm. Uh, so it's it's just a matter of time before these corporate consortiums decide that they also need to reach out to public chain as well to access information there. Um, Whether that's cross-chain asset trading or not might happen later. Uh, But simply accessing that information right now would require a vast rewrite of your system or moving to something else. So this traversing the trust boundary, traversing the firewall intentionally without invalidating the 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 kind of the trust relationship the data owner and the kind of data consumer had is is arguably the the kind of the battle line and and the future piece. I look at you know attempts by the Brave Browns and Basic Attention Token as being an interesting area to kind of play. Do you think it's going to move more into the the data space and the data processing space more so than just financial transactions? Oh, absolutely. Um, I especially think we're at this like very interesting uh, time with what's happening with GDPR and with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which is basically just business as usual. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's not a data breach. That's just a business model. Mm. Uh, but people are <laughs> people are waking up more and more to the way that their data is being used. But at the same time, they're very comfortable with the customer experiences that they've come to expect that absolutely. are driven off of their data. So I worry that um, if if, if this data starts to, you know, quote unquote, to use an FBI term, go dark, right? Mm-hmm. If people start to take their data and keep it away from these centralized data aggregators, then not only are they going to lose out on those customer experiences, um, but businesses are not going to take any take kindly to that. And we might get this kind of lobbying pushback against decentralization and against uh, distributed ledger technology uh, on a scale that we have not possibly seen yet. So I'd, I'd like to 
prevent that. Yes. <laughs> and part of that, you know, that's part of what we're doing with Clover, right, is is um, providing the kind of tools that when you, uh, this enterprise consortium wants to flip a switch and say, just allow somebody to log in with their, I don't know, Uport or Civic or what have you, um, then maybe they start there. Maybe they start with just wanting to pin a Merkle root to a public chain, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, but you know, later on, as these uh, as, as services become available, that allows you to say get that business value, the same kind of business value out of a private data set as you would have gotten by owning that data. Um, I think that's it's that's when the game changes. That's when the game changes because once you get to the point in which. Like, nobody has more data about you than you, not even Facebook. Mm -hmm. Like, nobody has more data about you than you, not even the government. Like, you are the aggregate, the ultimate aggregator of all your data. Now, if there is a way with zero knowledge proofs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to uh, perform queries on that and to be able to identify the information that creates economic value on the back of that data, then great. Uh, And maybe that's more valuable than the winner-take-all platform has now. And maybe that's net upside to certain winner-take-all platforms. Maybe that's net upside to government. Maybe that's net upside to me, the individual. But when anything seems like it's a win-win-win, it always feels like unachievable. But I mean, I guess it's a fair goal to go after. (laughs) Well, you know, what we're we're trying to do with Clover, it looks a lot like something like Heroku and Ruby on Rails, to be honest. I mean, these are (laughs) this is stuff that allowed um, developers to be able to build things faster, uh, to be able to scale and deploy and bring DevOps into the play. And then at the same time, if you think of the blockchain as as Ruby, Clover is something closer to Ruby on Rails. So you choose the components and you choose the libraries that you want to expose based on the sort of use case that you're building. And maybe sometimes that involves, you know, machine learning over private data sets and zero knowledge proofs. And sometimes it just uh, involves, you know, I don't know, uh, let's bring up CryptoKitties again, right? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Um, some it, other kind of more more uh, more practical things right now, and that's that's okay. Um, but so far, I think maybe like one percent of one percent of businesses have sunk money into exploring these blockchain use cases. Indeed. It's very expensive. There's expensive consultants involved. There's lots of legal negotiations involved. And so by empowering people um, to be able to build things themselves rather than yeah. have to go that consultant route, uh, you know, think of the explosion in websites and local sites that came online when Ruby on Rails became a thing. Not all consultants are created equal, by the way. But, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you yeah, know, but I take it. There, there are partners, though, right? Because yeah. instead of being able to build one case in three months and give over something that's unmaintainable that nobody likes, you can build 12 sites and give them over and have partners. So com- contrast this to me, because I think there's been the old blockchain as a service the idea around for some time. I mean, it's what Block started out to do. It's what the likes of Microsoft now claim mm-hmm. they do. Even Oracle say they do blockchain as a service but is this but is what they're doing this isn't blockchain as a service that's i mean spin up an instance of uh, spin up a node as a service yeah congratulations you have an empty excel spreadsheet like what do i do with this yeah um so sure, the uh, using Kubernetes in a way that allows you to be cloud agnostic is different than a single cloud provider providing a blockchain as a service that tries to capture an entire um, pilot or you know use case within a single environment. So I can hear my CTO Ewan behind the scenes going, well, I can use Kubernetes to be cloud agnostic today. What is the business model change? Because I always feel like it's a business model or governance change is why you'd use blockchain, right? Uh, I mean, people are trying to deploy this new technology, but there's no way to do that with existing DevOps processes. Right. So the business, you know, people ask, why don't you have a token? Don't you need an ICO? Yes, exactly. Just because there's a blockchain? No. Um, first off, a lot of the the applications that we would like to make available don't necessarily even need a blockchain. So we're focusing on, on peer-to-peer technologies in general. Uh, right now, certainly, a lot of the focus and the hype and the people that are waiting on us to to release this MVP that allows them to deploy and scale quickly um, have blockchains involved. Mm-hmm. But longer term, I think, um, you know, and, and where uh, I was focusing on the Quorum roadmap previously was around having the opportunity with this open source technology to create something that's best in class for the very top tier financial institutions in the world and make that available at the exact same cost basis of free mm-hmm. to, um, to other places in the world that might not have 
power 24 hours a day or might not have mm -hmm. um, equally available internet. And it's you can't just dump code in people's lap and call it a day. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to make that stuff anti-fragile, yeah. to bring in mesh networking um, and, and create kind of more self-healing peer-to-peer networks and to create different kind of proxying. Uh, and so it's that's just not something that you tack on later as a social good project. Mm -hmm. That's something that you architect for from the ground up. In the same way that we have privacy by design, yeah. uh, we're working on this kind of anti-fragility by design. And it's it's all part of, you know, one yeah. grand plan where sure, everyone will, you know, point at Amber and say, oh, she's enterprise blockchain. Yeah. Um, but that's because I think if you can't solve enterprise problems, what do you do? You're just working with a, a, a vacuum kind of echo chamber of the powerless. So we solve we solve problems at the top, and and it transcends to so others. I was talking to Sandra Rowe about uh, oh, yeah. five six episodes ago. I think it's episode thirty eight of Blockchain Insider, and uh, she talks about uh, the the kind of the project she's working on being like yes, she's working with rural farmers to collect the pricing information of how much were they paid for. Um, commodity X, so coffee or cotton or whatever it may be. And that pricing information is something that she can then sell to enterprise. She obviously comes mm -hmm. from a, an exchange background. She knows mm -hmm. capital markets inside out and backwards. She knows how valuable that data is, but she's also solving a problem with the local ground. So you're having to deal with that last mile problem. And if you're not solving for that last mile problem and you're not solving for enterprise, then are you really making any difference? I think is a fair question. Absolutely. You know, I uh, was giving a talk for a while that was called Beyond Maximalism. Oh. <laughs> and it is kind of like a pokey kind of of a statement. Um, but I think maximalism in, in all forms, it deters from us recognizing that most uh, solutions and most systems in the quote unquote real world are kind of this mix. And they don't really work for anybody, but they kind of work for everybody too. Yeah. And um, I would would love to have a, a future utopia where everything is completely egalitarian and it's a, you know, this beautiful kind of post meritocracy. Um, <laughs> but, but getting there isn't as easy as just moving to Puerto Rico, you know? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we need, um, we we are starting from a, a world that already exists and from people that have incumbent biases and from businesses that already exist. And, you know, it's one thing to to say we're going to burn down the banks and create a new financial institution. You know, fine, maybe we can kind of get behind that. Mm -hmm. But um, to say we're going to burn down all business everywhere mm. and create a new, uh, completely new commerce system globally, uh, it so sounds difficult. Yeah, it sounds hard. And, and would you like the consequences of having done that because if you were to achieve your goal you'd probably be dead and everyone you know and ever met would be dead so like the the consequences of the thing you think you want is probably not what you actually want so you're building a path out of today into tomorrow rather than fucking today and fucking tomorrow at the same person <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean if we could make even incremental improvements in the way that um people are able to uh achieve privacy without having to become privacy experts themselves mm -hmm. That would be a meaningful shift, I think, globally. And, you know, maybe it's one thing for people who have the time to t take the Facebook privacy security assessment that they pop up in your yeah. face every so often. And find the <laughs> tiny bit of text where you get the tiny next bit right. of text and you get to scroll and find, yeah. Exactly. Or now with the GDPR kind of regulations, you log in and they've given you 300 radio buttons for different places to get your data that you have to individually click off every yeah. single one, you know. Um, but most often the people that are really uh, the worst off because of those systems are are, are the um, least uh, the worst off economically in every other way mm -hmm. in the world, and so um, it's it's a human rights issue, and it's a it's a business issue. You know, if we want to reimagine what business can be, um, it doesn't mean we have to burn everything down and start from from the bottom up. But uh, can you position it as an opportunity for business as it well? Is, so we yeah. talked briefly about how uh, it's an opportunity for the winner take all platform to have a bigger data set uh, to work with, but the only way they get that bigger data set is by introducing actual privacy. Uh, the only way governments get a bigger data set to prevent crime is by introducing actual privacy and, and, and in, you know, kind of baking that in with software. What's the, the business case benefit for, for somebody else? If it's not just, if I'm not Facebook, then what's, what's my business case to moving towards this world? Because banks and financial services companies understand their business model. They understand where they are. And frankly, look, it looks like the last 10 years of regulation being the issue have gone away. It's, it's off to the races now, surely. What's the motivation for moving in this direction for them? Uh, I mean, why don't we ask the CEO of Equifax? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but uh, data used to be considered gold, and now maybe it's more like oil, and you're at risk of an oil spill in, in some ways. So uh, again, I think you're right. Losing access to that data would be 
uh, tragic for for businesses as they operate today. But shifting the model so that they can still achieve that same business value without having to own it all in a centralized way um, could absolutely be transformative. And historically, people have always chosen um, convenience over privacy and security, mm-hmm. right? But maybe if if monetization uh, or uh, economic incentives were thrown into that mix, uh, I certainly think that people, at least in the millennial generation and beyond, who are used to this kind of microeconomics and like like based, uh, you know, business models on, on Instagram and whatnot, would absolutely figure out how to monetize their data mm-hmm. uh, in a way that could create an entire new kind of gig economy. Now, would it be more dystopian or less? I, I don't know. That's a fair, fair question <laughs> and an interesting place to leave the interview. Uh, where can people find out more about Clover? Sure. Um, we're at Clover.io. It's C-L-O-V-Y-R. Mm-hmm. So it's not Clovier, it's Clover. No, it's it's Clover. And that's, um, you know, initially that was about highway interchanges and kind of the Cloverleaf interchanges, mm-hmm. right, of on and off ramps between networks, because I don't think it's a winner-take-all platform. We're just facilitating that kind of exchange. But now it's, it's kind of transcended in my mind to being more about uh, this ecosystem of different things that come together, where for true sustainability, you need a diversity of elements that work together and balance each other. Amber Balde, thank you very much for being on Blockchain Insider. Thank you.